Um, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Bernard Eaton. I'm the licensed lay minister at St. Peter in the Forest, Walthamstow, and it's our pleasure to host um, this history, uh, social history um, talk from by Esther Freeman. Um, as you both will know, um, LGBT History Month is a long, a month-long annual observance of um, LBGT plus history and the history of gay rights and related civil rights movements. It was founded in 1994 by a chap called Rodney Wilson, a school history teacher, and it was intended and does provide role models, builds community, and represents a civil rights statement about the contributions of LGBTQ plus community. It's part of our offer at St Peter's to stand with the LBGT plus community by hosting this splendid um, event and also um, to offer alongside it a, uh, an exhibition at our church building um, of uh, photographic and artistic representations um, of the um, involvement of LBGT plus people in our history and the world. Um, we were very fortunate because we had a significant grant provided by the National Heritage um, Lottery Fund to refurbish our building. So we've got this splendid place to showcase um, exhibitions of that sort. Um, and um, But we're conscious of the fact that the church has for centuries had issues and mental entanglements and emotional entanglements um, over the role and rights of LBGT plus people. And it's still undergoing some measure of difficulty um, topically at the moment, what constitutes a marriage within the church and whether blessings of civil partnerships and or weddings might be allowed in the next year or so. And there are long conversations going on about that. And there are different views about how the church can resolve those issues, or at least walk comfortably alongside while the issues remain unresolved in a caring and loving way. St Peter's is an inclusive Church of England parish. And our view is that we welcome everybody, whoever you are, and however God made you. And that's how we express the unconditional love of God for our communities. And this is just one way. So without more ado, um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask, we're five minutes in, I'm going to um, ask Esther Freeman, uh, a social historian with considerable skill in this area, to um, give us her presentation about the contributions of the LBGT plus community, women, um, over um, time. Thank you very much. Um, so I'll just, I've got some slides to share, but I'll just thought I'd start off by just explaining who I am and, and the project and who I work for. So yeah, my name is Esther and I'm a social historian and I specialize in women's history and particularly women from East London. So for the sake of the project, East London is um, defined as Wolf and Forest, Tower Hamlets, Hackney and Newham. Um, so we began um, researching, uh, I decided I wanted to focus on women activists, and that's because prior to moving into this role, I um, spent many years working for campaigning organisations, I, you know, I consider myself still an activist, um, and I was very interested in who came before me and um, how long the fight has been going on. So we applied to the Heritage Lottery Fund for a grant to research the um, history of uh, women-led activism um, in East London from 1880 to the present day. And we ran that from roughly between 2015 to 2018. Um, now, as part of that um, 
we wanted the project to be intersectional, so we looked at the communities within East London, so lots of Jewish history in that, lots of Bengali history in that. Um, but one of the topics we didn't really quite get into in that first phase of the project was, um, well, what, what I call queer women activists. So there may be lesbians, bisexual, transgender women. Um, and because I didn't just want to kind of shoehorn it in there, I wanted to give it a, like, a proper attention because I just thought this is a really complex and uh, issue. Um, we applied for a second grant to Heritage Lottery Fund, which they kindly gave us. And we did two more years research um, to dig up stories um, from across East London. And um, we collected all histories. We found stories in the archive. Um, and we collated this uh, amazing collection of stories and we're just about to do what I call our public education part of our projects, which is doing our exhibitions and talks and um, also podcasts and all sorts of things that we do. Um, and we got hit by the pandemic. <laughs> so we did do a lot of stuff online still. Um, but all the talks and things that we scheduled never really, well, they sort of happened, but they didn't happen how I really wanted them. So when I saw that St. Peter's were doing something for this special month, I was really keen to kind of partner with them so we could kind of start to do some of the stuff that we never got around to doing because of the pandemic. Um, so part of our work is in the exhibition um, that Bernard mentioned before, and obviously I'm here tonight to um, talk about the project. So um, I'm going to get on now and tell you about the history. So let me share my screen. Uh, oops, I think I just... Oh, sorry. I need to go back to the first slide and try that again. Right, so as I said, um, the project focuses on women from East London from 1880 to the present day. And but what I'm going to talk about uh, today are specifically queer women activists. Um, but first of all, I want to talk about um, why women? Why did I decide to do women other than obviously I am a woman? Um, and the reason is, is because of who gets remembered um, in history. And when we look back through time, uh, the women that uh, get remembered are, are fairly narrow. And often when women have achieved big things, they still don't get remembered. So I thought it'd be a little bit of fun here if we could do a quiz and you can either just write your answers down on a bit of paper next to you if you know them um, or you can write them in the chat and we'll come back to them at the end but these are some questions from history to see if you can guess who um, who these people are so do you know who first discovered the greenhouse gas effect so that's the first question who discovered the greenhouse gas effect the second question is who invented computer programming? So it's not the computer, but computer programming. And the third question is who invented GPS? So the things that all um, power our sat navs, uh, who invented GPS? So it might be fairly obvious from the fact that I am a women's historian that these people maybe are all women, um, but it's, Chances are people didn't realise, or certain may not even realise that women invented all those things. And certainly, it will, well, we'll see at the end if anyone knows the names of those people. So here's the wider context to all of that. So only around 17% of articles about notable people on Wikipedia are about women. Only about 14% of blue packs are dedicated to women. And only one in five statues is de are dedicated to women. So who does get remembered? So uh, some of you may be aware of a woman called Susan B. Anthony, and she is a very famous suffragette. She's American. Now, in America, she's extremely well known, but I suspect even some people in this country will have heard about her. 
she's kind of like the Emmeline Pankhurst of America. Um, and she's, she's hailed as a hero, but what we're often told less is that she did not support black women in getting the vote. And in fact, there was a big parade in Washington um, in 1913, um, where she actually tried to bar black women from the parade. However, she didn't really account for a leading black activist called Ida B. Wells, who argued that barring them was unconstitutional. And eventually the, the, the black women were agreed, they did agree to admit them, but she told them that uh, they had to march at the back. But Ida wasn't having any of this. And she snuck her way to the front. And there's this wonderful picture of her here on our side. I just love the look on her face. She wasn't having any of that. She marched at the front and she took her rightful place. Now, some people might think, well, this is America. America's really racist, isn't it? But actually a very similar situation uh, developed here within the suffragette movement as well. Um, there was actually in East London a working class suffragette called uh, Rose Whitcock, who described the uh, Women's Social and Political Union, which is the group that was led by Emmeline Pankhurst, as bourgeois suffragettes. And lots of the working class suffragettes in East London felt very excluded from the movement by them. They did set up, the WSPU did set up branches in East London, um, which were set up by Emmeline's middle daughter, Sylvia, who, who was a very committed socialist um, and very supportive of the working class communities in East London. But her uh, elder sister, Christabel, um, took over and the support from these East London branches was gradually uh, withdrawn. And also, just like the march with uh, the Black women and Ida B. Wells, there was a march in London where working class women were told to march at the back. Now, the, the argument for this was given that it was for their own protection, but it infuriated the working class East London suffragettes. One suffragette called Adelaide Knight, who was secretary of the Canning Town branch, was so furious about this that she actually resigned her position in protest in 1910. And the branch actually closed down uh, soon after, citing general lack of support. And um, very soon after that, actually, all East London branches had closed down and there was actually no official um, suffragette presence uh, in East London. Um, for another four years, when in 1914, um, Silvio Panka set up the East London Federation of Suffragettes. I would love to talk to you about that today, but um, we're, that's a whole other presentation. Um, but the, the point I'm making here that was that there was this divide. Um, and Christabel Panka said, quote, a working women's movement was of no value. Working women were the weakest portion of the sex. How could it be otherwise? Their lives were too hard, their education too meager to equip them for the struggle, end quote. It's also, people don't tend to realize that Emmeline Pankhurst was only campaigning for the vote on the same terms as men, which would have left around 40% of the working women out of the franchise. So a lot of women in East London um, were just, they weren't campaigning for the vote for them, basically. So the reason I'm talking about all of this is because when we do talk about women's history, what gets remembered tends to focus on either the aristocracy or middle-class white women. So when I started this project, the questions I was asking is, where is the history of the poor and black women? Where is the history of the poor and disabled women? And of course, where is the history of the poor and queer women? So our project has been trying to dig out those stories so that all communities have their heroes to remember. And people today will understand the broader history in which they are part of. So I am just would like to now, I hope you this works OK, I'm going to um, play you a little video about uh, it was it was very difficult to research. Um, queer women activists prior to 1970, and I will explain why 1970 was important later on. But that early period was quite difficult. And I, I just want to play you a little video that we made as part of this project, which sets up some of the issues. Oh. Thank you. 
trying to identify which women were in queer relationships is really difficult because as a historian, the way you identify these women is that they identify themselves. And certainly from around the 1930s onwards, that was happening more and more. But in this early period, this period of the suffragettes, it wasn't happening because the word lesbian did not exist in the, this area. So they didn't really have the, the language to describe their sexual preferences. Um, and because female relationships uh, were operating, because women were operating in these highly oppressive uh, states of marriage and social life, female relationships were different. And we did have these um, things that become, become known as romantic friendships. And I, some of them are mentioned in that video between Christabel Pankhurst and Annie Kenny. But we can't say that some people have identified those two as being in a couple, but quite frankly, there isn't really the evidence for that. It could have just been a very, very passionate friendship. Um, and it is really important that we do not look back through a modern lens and assign sexual preferences to other women. However, we can say that some of these women were lesbians of course they were and some of them were bisexual people because those people have always existed and so all we can really do is look for clues so with the story of Mary Lee and Emily Davison there were some clues there were clearly a very strong bond between them there's this note between them that this um that said the dear love of comrades um which is, is meant to uh, be a reference, it's a Walt Whitman poem, which is meant to reference same-sex relationships. However, many historians um, have said, is this really enough evidence to say that they were in a, a relationship that was more um, than a friendship? And I think, I think I'm kind of with the school of thought that it probably isn't enough evidence. Um, it could have just been, as, as the video said, many suffragettes rejected marriage. They lived in female only communes. This may have been them just rejecting that heteronormative lifestyle. However, there is one woman where there is a bit more evidence and her name is Eva Slauson. And this is, um, we had a, I couldn't find a, a proper image of her. So we had this lovely illustration commissioned um, of her. Um, now she is from East London. In fact, she um, uh, lived right here in Waltham Forest. She was born in 1882 in West Ham and moved to Leighton 20 years later. She was a Christian socialist and a member of the Independent Labour Party, which is the um, before the Labour Party became the Labour Party, it was, it was slightly different form and it was called the Independent Labour Party. And she was a member of that in Leighton. And she also joined the Women's Freedom League, which was um, another suffragette um, movement. Um, she has written, there is a book that has um, collected a lot of her letters and diary entries um, with, between her and her friend Ruth Slate. And within those, there is a letter where she talks about reading Edward Carpenter's Love, Love's Coming of Age. Now, this was a really important text because um, Edward Carpenter um, was a gay man and he was also very supportive of the suffragette and feminist movement. And he wrote this book um, about kind of it was sort of 60s hippie culture before there was 60s hippie culture so he was sort of saying throw off the shackles of marriage and and it was considered quite outrageous at the time but he was talking about like different kinds of love and Eva read this book um and was very moved about it and in the letter she says quote my views on marriage are altering to an alarming extent I really believe some people would call my opinions immoral end quote um, so she's having this kind of moment where she's starting to question things. She's starting to question marriage um, and ideas about marriage. And then in 1911, she meets an older married woman called Mina Simmons. And very sadly, uh, Mina's husband died. And uh, Eva and Mina had already formed a very strong friendship at this point. So, and, and Mina was actually pregnant at the time. And uh, in... Um, Eva's diary, she says that she moved into Mina's house in Walthamstow to help her with the baby. 
But it's very clear that this relationship soon started to take on a, another dimension, a, a quite a, a passionate dimension. And she, in her diary, um, expresses quite intense emotions about the, the nature of their relationship. Um, I've got a little uh, quote here. Um, she says, quote, such waves of love pass through me at times. I quiver with feeling. And tonight in bed, it seems our very souls and bodies mingled in love and sympathy, end quote. So although this is not an explicit reference to sexual interaction, it would not be an unreasonable interpretation. And especially if we go back to remembering that, that she would not have had the language that we have today to describe what was going on in this relationship. Um, so that leaves us to question, uh, what was actually going on in that bed? And as I was asking these questions, as I was doing this research, I started to say, is this any of my business? What was going on in their bed? And so it kind of, you know, you want to, it brings up lots of difficulties. You want to celebrate this history. But when we go back to this early um, period, without projecting our own uh, modern views, uh, our own language, and maybe straying into territory that really is none of our business, it is quite difficult to really identify which women may have fallen under the banner that we use today as queer. But it is clear that the relationship between Eva and Mina was intense. And what I settled on in the end was describing it, uh, these women as uh, rejecting heteronormative lifestyles. And really in that age, that was huge in itself. And, and I think we should just remember that bravery maybe without trying to delve into exactly what the nature of their relationship was. So now we're going to move on to the 1930s. And this was an era where people started to talk more openly about same-sex relationships. However, it was still very dangerous to do so. Um, it was illegal for men and they could be arrested. And even although it wasn't illegal for women, they did still face social stigma and isolation. And this is the area where we see the obscenity trial for the um, novel, The well of, well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall, which was a, a book which openly talked about lesbian relationships. Radcliffe Hall was in a lesbian relationship herself. And it, it's uh, for us today, if you read the book, it's really not explicit. And it doesn't actually even particularly celebrate lesbian relationships. I mean, it's she, she the main character, um, is quite depressed <laughs> a lot of the time. Um, so it, it seems, it seems, I guess, peculiar to us nowadays that it could be the subject of an obscenity trial, but it was a very big scandal at the time. But I think this is what happens when social um, attitudes are changing and uh, without going to, down too much of a rabbit hole, but we, we are seeing it now in the rise of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is now seen a, re seen a real backlash, particularly in America, uh, around critical race theory and the banning of books that, um, uh, using air quotes now, but promote critical race theory. And we've, we've seen lots of American states ban this. And this is kind of what happens when we have these, these movements where oppressed people start to rise up and uh, try and claim their space. So this is what was going on in the 1930s. Um, so one woman that uh, we focused on um, in this period was uh, Naomi Jacob, who was actually born in Ripon in Yorkshire in 1884. And some of you may have heard about her. She was quite a famous author. Um, now, <laughs> I have to admit, her links to East London were a, a bit tenuous. Um, but we decided to keep her in because she's just such an interesting figure. Um, but and certainly her politics um, were were definitely there. She was a member of the WSPU, the, the Women's Social and Political Union, the suffragette group, and she was also a, a member of the Labour Party. Um, and and our, our link. Uh, we think to, um, to East London is that we think she stood as a prospective parliamentary candidate in East Ham, although I was never able to actually completely verify that. Um, but she's she's very interesting. She um, uh, her sexuality was an open secret. She had an affair with the actress Marguerite Broadfoot and she wore suits and a monocle. She smoked cigars and answered to the name Mickey, Jake or Jacob. 
It really wasn't until the 1970s, though, that we see this real breakthrough um, in terms of um, uh, gay liberation, as it was called back then. And some of you may know that in 1969, um, there were the Stonewall riots, um, which kind of kicked off the, the, moment, the movement. It's described as some as the moment where the the gay community fought back. They've been oppressed by the police for so long and, and they decided to fight back and that's how the riots started. And out of the riots um, came the Gay Liberation Front, uh, which first started in America, but there were also um, some, some English people who were over there at the time. And in 1970, they came back and set up the Gay Liberation Front in London. And uh, although this was a male dominated organization, there were some women involved and they were very important. And one of those women uh, was Annie Brax. Um, and she um, uh, was she was there from the beginning, from when it formed in 1970. Um, and she uh, was particularly interested in communal living where, quote, Children were the shared responsibility of the group and no gender role system would operate, end quote. So um, interestingly, Hackney became a bit of a haven for women only squats. And many of these uh, were lesbian households. Um, and there was a practical purpose for this because during this time in the 1970s, there was a real lack of housing. Um, so it was very difficult for a lot of people to find a home. But if you were um, a, a member of the LGBT community, um, it could be uh, even more difficult because you were much more likely to be rejected, vilified or even beaten up in your uh, in your quest for a home. So the, the women came together and a lot of them, as I said, were lesbians. And what they would do was that they would find an empty home and then they would do it up. And they, they literally taught themselves skills like plumbing and electrics. Um, and, and there was a, quite a community of them around um, East London. Um, and actually it got so that they became, got such a reputation for themselves um, for doing up these abandoned houses and actually making them good again, that people in the local community would start alerting them to an empty home because actually it, it helped everyone um, because people didn't want to live next to a rat infested house and these women needed some place to live. So if they could find a home and it, it meant that the house got done up and the street became nicer, it worked out for everyone. Um, and Annie said, that the collective action of changing the locks on the squat became a highly symbolic act. So then we head into the 1980s and we of course have the AIDS pandemic. And then in the 1990s, we see this new era of sweeping changes for LGB rights. So in that period, we have the repeal of section 28. So if this isn't something you've heard about of, this was um, a law that was brought in um, under Thatcher, which um, uh, banned local authorities from promoting um, homosexuality. And so what, what that meant was in schools that were run by the local authority, they weren't allowed to talk to the children um, about LGB um, lifestyles. So there was a whole generation of which I am part um, that grew up never hearing anything about that at all. It was just, it just wasn't there in our education. Um, and then in 2002, there was the Adoption and Children's Act, which um, uh, allowed, um, well, what it actually allowed was unmarried people to um, adopt. But what the effect of that was, was that we suddenly saw um, people in same sex relationships coming forward um, and, and adopting together. Um, so it was a kind of bit of a byproduct um, of that act. We also see the Equalities Act, which grants sweeping new rights um, to access to services from a range of um, what they call protected characteristics. So people with disabilities. Um, and of course, that, that included um, members of the, LG, the LGBT community. And then in 2014, we have 
uh, the introduction of same-sex marriage in England and Wales, which was soon followed by other devolved nations. So it's actually no coincidence that the two things, the 1980s AIDS pandemic and the 1990s new era of rights um, happened one after another. AIDS brought the community together, groups of resistance formed, strategies developed and change happened because of this awful thing that happened to them, but it actually gave them um, uh, these skills in which they originally were fighting for things like drugs and access to treatment, but led on to them having all the skills and tools to fight for all these other things. Um, so it, AIDS actually provided the pathway towards a new era of liberation. And you, some of you may have noticed, I, I actually talked about LGB during this, this last section, and that's for a reason. Um, that's because trans rights, the T, um, have not got as far yet. Now, there has been some progress made. In 2004, the Gender Re Recognition Act was introduced. And one of the people who um, was an important part of developing that was Ros Cavani, who is pictured here. And uh, Ros is a trans activist from Hackney. She's also a writer and a poet. And she said, quote, I was raised, raised excuse me, I was ra reared Catholic, but got over it, was born male, but got over it, stopped sleeping with boys about the same time I stopped being one, and I am much happier than I was when I was younger, end quote. So, as I mentioned, she was part of the policy forum for the Gender Recognition Act, which allowed trans people to change their birth certificate to um, the gender to which they identify. Um, now, it, it certainly is, it is full of problems, the act, um, and Ros has said that it, it was a disappointing conclusion, um, and that they are, that there were still moves uh, it gets a bit complicated, but um, they're still pushing to, to improve that act, to make it better. It's very complicated to try, to try and get it to get your birth certificate changed, even though you're allowed to. So they're still fighting for that. Um, but she's done many other things as well. She was a member of the Feminists Against Censorship. She was the former deputy chair of Liberty. She's a deputy editor of the transgender related magazine Meta. However, trans people, especially trans women, still face many barriers to full equality, including in the health, um, social acceptance and at work. And they are particularly the target of online transphobia, um, which is particularly bad in this country, much worse than in America for some reason. And Roz is particularly singled out because she has a bit of a profile. She has been particularly singled out for attack. So in conclusion, LGBTQ people have always existed, but how do we identify them when they could not identify themselves? So this is the this early era from the sort of 1880 to around 1930. It, it, they, they were there and there is a history there, but um, mapping that out was, was quite challenging. It is important to acknowledge queer history um, because it provides a narrative for that community and an understanding of the fight that came before. It allows people to understand their place in the broader history to which they belong, which I think is particularly important for young people today um, who, who are still continuing this fight. We have seen huge progress in LGBTQ rights, but they are constantly under threat and um, under from far right groups and uh, including and also capitalism, if we look at what's been happening with gay pride, which emerged out of the um, Stonewall riots and Gay Liberation Front, which was originally just a celebration of coming out, out and proud. And it's now turned into a very commercial event where you have to buy a license to be part of it. And um, lots of ordinary people just found, find themselves excluded because uh, and a lot of people complain it's just become a money making exercise. And so that history of where gay pride came from and what it was about and why it had emerged is getting lost. Um, and it's really important that we, we do not forget this, this fight because of the constant attack that it's under. It's also really important that, that everyone 
um, show solidarity with the trans community who are still fighting for some of those same rights, the rights that other members of the queer community have already won. Um, and I've been reading and listening to a lot of trans women talking recently, and they just say that a lot of them just can't even be on social media anymore because it's just too bad for their mental health. And, and so they say that a voice of a support in a world of hate can mean a lot to that community. So I, I, if you can do one thing during this month is reach out as hand of friendship and kindness to a trans person, I think that wouldn't be, I don't think you can underestimate actually how valuable that would be as an act of solidarity and allyship. Um, and Sean Fay, who is a, a trans right activist and, and journalist, um, argues that trans rights are also women's rights, because if you look at the things that they're fighting for, they're often the same things that cisgendered women are fighting for. So there are things like health care, body autonomy. There's a lot of parallels between the, the fight for the right to abortion and, and um, or... Um, Sorry, I've suddenly got cats jumping over my computer. Um, or, you know, um, uh, the, the right uh, to ne not be sexually assaulted. Um, it's about body autonomy. Um, and that's, that is really what trans uh, people are fighting for as well. And also the freedom from violence um, where trans uh, women are around the world are disproportionately impacted. Uh, Sean Fay says, Liberation for trans women brings liberation for all women. So um, what I thought we could do is just go back to, um, I will stop sharing my screen now. Um, and I don't know if anyone's, um, uh, oh, there's, there's no answers to the questions. Did, it, did anyone know any of the answers to the questions I asked at the beginning? about greenhouse gas, computer programming, and GPS? Uh, I, will, I will just tell you them then. So, um, a woman called Eunice Newton Foote presented a, a paper in 1856 on the subject of greenhouse gas effect, but her discovery was eclipsed when three years later, Irish physici physician, um, sorry, physicist, uh, John Tyndale made the same discovery. He is now considered the father of climate science. Um, so poor old Eunice uh, got elbowed out there. And who invented computer programming? This is a little more known. I don't know if anyone knows this because this particular woman has been getting an increased profile recently. So a man called Charles Babbage invented the computer but he saw it as merely as a very fancy calculating machine. So he, it was just a fancy calculator to him. It was actually a woman called Ada Lovelace who hypothesized what computers could do. And she saw them as far more than just adding up numbers. Um, and this, uh, one of her visions, she wrote this paper um, where she actually foresaw making music. And I say to my daughter, you have iTunes because my daughter's called Ada. So I say, you have iTunes because of Ada Lovelace, because <laughs> she foresaw that you could make um, um, and enjoy music with computers. And she was born in 1815. And who invented GPS? Well, her name was Gladys West. And she was one of the many black women involved in the technological advancement in the US in the era before the civil rights movement. Some of you may have seen the movie Hidden Figures about some other um, women who were working um, as part of the space program. So she's kind of part of that generation. 